This call is now being recorded. Okay, so uh, we're going to continue talking about handle attachments today. Um, handle attachments. So um, our setup, and I'm going to extend the setup a little bit, is we have x, a manifold, a compact manifold with boundary. With boundary. And then for such an x, we fix a Morse function. A Morse function. And we will require a couple of properties. So we will require that all the critical points uh, have different images. So the pre image of a regular, of a critical value only has uh, such that this is equal to one for each critical value, A. Um, and if x has boundary, we, uh, if x, if the boundary of x is different from uh, the empty set, then we require that the maximum that, that the function on the boundary is constant, equal to the maximum, and that this value is strictly bigger than the function in the interior. And we also require that, uh, we require that the critical points are contained in the interior. Okay, so basically everything that's happening that's interesting is below the boundaries. And we proved that such a function always exists. We proved that such an f always exists. OK? So you know the picture that you yes. should have in mind is something like this. Yes. Oi. Sorry for interrupting you, but I don't think you are sharing your screen. Oh, I'm not? No, you're not. Yes, yeah, he is. Someone or... is seeing it, someone is not seeing it. So do you see it or not? No, I can't see it. I you can? can't? Or... Yeah, you can. Yeah, I'm going to leave and then come back. OK, Maybe. go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I think, can everybody else see it? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Um, so we know that such a function always exists. And what we did last time was we showed that given a function like this, that we did it for the case without boundary, we can find a handle uh, decomposition. So we can split the manifold into um, basically a sequence of handle attachments. So what I want to explain is what these things are more, more specifically. I want to say that one more time. So, and, and how did we do that? We basically said, well, let's look at the critical values. So if this is my function um, f, first of all, I prove that if you look at a um, level, uh, if I look at, here's my ABC, well, if you look at a, a regular value, then if you move uh, if you move regular values, the pre-image of uh, what's below that regular value is going to be unchanged up to a diffeomorphism. So basically, we just have to choose any regular value between those two uh, critical values. Okay, so let me maybe write this down. So let p one through pk will be the critical points. So I'm going to write critical points of f are p1 through pk uh, such that ai is f of pi and a1 is less than a2 is less than etc. is less than ak. So what we need, what we, 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 we know now is that 
we, we have that expression a f a x a, which is the pre-image of minus infinity a. And we know that if we move a uh, through, uh, through an interval of regular values, the diffeomorphism type of x a doesn't change. OK, so if a is less than a1, then x a is empty. And then as you go through a1, that's when something happens. So what, what I explained last time is this process of handle attachment, which is what happens as you go through a critical value. OK, so basically, you know, there's a finite step, a, a finite number of, of uh, changes to the, to the diffeomorphism type of the manifold that go from uh, the minimum to the maximum. OK, and the same thing happens with a manifold with boundary. The only difference is that um, you don't have a maximum. The maximum is not a critical value anymore. So uh, basically, if you are above the, high, the, the, critical, the critical value of the highest, uh, the, 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 the biggest critical value, then you're going to have the same diffeomorphism type. And then you go through the boundary of the manifold, and you continue with the same diffeomorphism type. OK, so that's, that's the only difference. But it doesn't really change anything uh, dramatically if you have a manifold with boundary. As long as you assume this condition, um, if you don't assume the condition of the maximum, then things could get very wild with a manifold with boundary. OK, so let's see again what happens. So um, I'm not going to draw all the pictures again. But I think you remember. Oh, yeah. One question. Mm -hmm. uh, when you stand between valores regulares, the interval, the type of diffeomorphism, the same type, uh -huh. Mas a gente conseguiu, na verdade, um difamorfismo do ambiente, né? Que quando restringe, dá um difamorfismo entre certo. os subconjuntos. Não foi certo. isso? Foi. Do ambiente, que é a variedade em si. Que é a variedade. Não, é, não é o ambiente onde a variedade está mergulhada. Não, não. Se ela estiver mergulhada. Exatamente. É. Tá. But I think, you know, it's more when you think about these sub-manifolds, you know, X, A, it's better to think about them as like pieces of the manifold, building blocks. They're not sub-manifolds in the same way as we think about other sub-manifolds, you know. I mean, you, you can talk about sub-manifolds of codimension zero, but that's not very typical. That's not very common, you know, because these are, these are uh, sub-manifolds of codimension zero. They're they really should be thought of as pieces of the of the manifold and not so much as submanifolds. But yes, you're right that this diffeomorphism can be extended to a diffeomorphism of the whole manifold. Um, okay, so um, you know the process that we that we use to attach handles. You know, it's basically looking at what's happening as you cross a critical value. And I'm going to try to draw that picture quickly again. Um, so we had. So you look in a neighborhood of the um, critical value. And so what I said is, you know, like you look at this. We know that locally near the critical, near the critical point, so if this is your PI, the function in a Morse chart will look like um, f of P PI, and then you have a minus quadratic part, a negative quadratic part. And then you have a positive quadratic part. And then I, my, in, my, in my picture here, this is an RK horizontally. And the vertical part is an R n minus k. And so because of you know, this picture, um, here we have an f. This is the level set. The, the yellow thing is the level set of uh, a i minus epsilon, and this red is the level set of a i plus epsilon. So again, uh, we, this is um, this is the picture in the mention for n equals two and k equals one, uh, but there is a similar picture. For like they, they, these basically are going to become hyperboloids, uh, higher dimensional hyperboloids, uh, if, for you know a different a k, 
and a different k and a different n. The case k equals zero or k equals n is slightly different because then one of them is going to be empty. Uh, but if k is between one and n minus one, then we have these hyperboloids, which can be connected or disconnected depending on, on the k and the n. But they're usually connected, but sometimes they're disconnected. Okay, actually, the, yeah. So if k is equal to one, then the yellow one's gonna be disconnected. And if k is equal to n minus one, then the red one is gonna be disconnected, just in the case where s zero is disconnected. Okay, so um, I guess, yeah. So basically what I, what I said last time is we have this h, which is this um, neighborhood of the critical point inside. So this is what I'm calling h. So this h is just the level um, what's between ai minus epsilon and, and, and ai plus epsilon, but intersected with a small neighborhood of pi. So with a small neighborhood of pi. And uh, then uh, the rest, which I called r last time, Let's see if I have a color for this. This green part is what I called R. Okay. And then the procedure that I that I did is well, it's it's kind of clear from this picture by that that how do you obtain uh, x a i plus epsilon? Well, this is just x a i minus epsilon, and then you take the union with h, and you take the union with R. Okay, so this is basically just a decomposition. There is nothing very interesting here. But the thing that's that's actually interesting is if you now quotient by, you suppose that you have a, um, you fix a gradient-like vector field, for example, the gradient for some metric. So after fixing, fixing a gradient-like vector field, I think I'm not writing with black. Not a very big deal. But. So after fixing a gradient like vector field on all of X, now we can quotient both H and R, or actually you quotient R, you just quotient this uh, purple boundary of H by the flow of this vector field. So we quotient. Um, R and the part of the boundary of H that intersects R by the flow of this vector field. Okay, so R in R, it's you know basically very easy. Although, yeah, I mean the part the part of H. The part of the boundary of H that intersects R is an R, so I guess I don't have to say this. Uh, we just quotient R by the flow of this vector field, and we actually end up uh, collapsing part of the boundary of H. Um, okay, that's fine. So, you know, this this gradient vector field, what it's th this gradient-like vector field, what it's doing is it's doing like this. And if we choose an appropriate gradient-like vector field, which is a gradient-like vector field that's compatible with the Euclidean metric near here, it's actually going to be along, it's going to flow along this uh, purple part. Okay, this purple part is exactly, I mean, I wrote all, the, all of this down last time, but this purple part is the boundary of H intersected with R, and this is just the set of X and Y in this neighborhood U, such that um, norm of x, norm of h is equal to epsilon. And the flow of the vector field is going to keep the norm of x, uh... yes, that's right. It's going to keep the norm of x, and it's going to keep the norm of, it's going to keep the product of the norm of x with the norm of y. Okay. 
uh, so you, um, yeah, you you collapse by that. So maybe you know again, it's it's it might be easier to just look at it in this in this two dimensional picture. But the same exact thing is is holding higher dimensions, except that you don't collapse the whole thing to a point. So in dimension two, in for n equals two and k equals one, you collapse this whole purple thing to a point. But in higher dimensions, you don't collapse the whole thing to a point. You collapse it to um, the product of two spheres. So in higher dimensions, um, we actually we collapse. Um, the, in particular, we collapse the boundary of H intersected with R to an SK times an SN minus K minus one. Uh, no, SK minus one. Which is why here you collapse the uh, these purple things actually to four points. So when you do when you collapse, then what you end up with is you end up with the following uh, figure. You end up. Wait, where is it? Where were my colors? Was it this one? I lost it. Okay, well, it's fine. So you end up with uh, this part, this part, and then you have this red part, like this. And then basically here, they are the same. They, they get collapsed. And now the part, uh, the the R is just collapsed to the boundary of what you already had. So you basically only end up with uh, the H. So you end up with what happens after you collapse H. Okay. So the 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 result is that up to smoothening the corners, uh, which is a which is a slight issue, you know, the, the sort of sort of here these these points here here are four points, but it's along the sphere. We have some smoothness question, but uh, without uh, without regarding smoothness, what happens is x a i plus epsilon now is just x union this h tilde glued in some way. Okay. And then maybe this was Luciano's question. So what is this H tilde? So I claimed last time that this H tilde is basically um, at least homeomorphic to uh, B K times B N minus K. Okay. Uh, and you know, why is that? Like how, how can you see that? Um, I, I mean, I think you, if you, um, I think you can actually parametrize, you can find an embedding of this guy into, into this. Uh, you can find an embedding of B K times B N minus K that will map exactly here. And I think, you know, the embedding is, I know, basically you take X, Y, and then you have to kind of take into account that th these are kind of bending, uh, and they have this shape. I, 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 I'll have to think a little bit about how to how to put it in, but I think you, you have to kind of compensate one for the other um, using somehow using this uh, something you know ab about like multiplying the norms. I, I haven't. I, I think it's it's not a very hard calculation. It's something that will not be well defined uh, unless you collapse these parts to a point. The, the, these purple parts to 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 uh, to this to the sphere here. Okay, but I mean, in another way to see it is like the interior of this is clearly diffeomorphic to a ball, to an n-dimensional ball. Okay, the interior of h h tilde is clearly diffeomorphic to the interior of a ball. And then after you collapse, you actually can look 
at these parts here. You can look at the intersection of that with uh, this part, uh, and then this, you know, this this part here. And it's not hard to see. This is still what it was before. Um, so because you haven't collapsed this. And before, you know, actually, I think I did a calculation here to show that this is an SK times a B n minus K. And that this other part here, uh, this red part here, I think I also did the calculation, or it's an analogous calculation to show that this is a, sorry, it's B S n K minus 1. And this is a B uh, K times an S n minus K minus 1. OK, so again, it, it's maybe not completely obvious, but if you play around with this expression of f, you know, it's bas it basically becomes a, an exercise in multivariable calculus. OK? Um, all right, so uh, let me explain again like what the process of handle attachment is. So what's the process of handle attachment? It's exactly what this thing uh, is giving you. So. The, the process is the following. The process of handle attachment. So you take a manifold, a compact manifold, manifold with boundary. And then you need what's called an attaching map. So what's an attaching map? An attaching map is telling you how to glue this handle on this uh, yellow part or golden part. Okay, so what is, what is how to glue? What, what's the information they need to glue? You need an embedding of a par part of the boundary of H to this. So it's exactly the part of the boundary, which is SK minus 1 uh, times uh, this part here, times VN minus K. So you need an embedding. which I'm going to call phi, that goes from sk minus 1 times bn minus k into the boundary of y. And if you're given that, then you can attach a handle. Then we can attach a handle. And how does this process work? Well, what you do is you take your y, and you take the union with a disjoint union with bk times bn minus k. And then you glue by this attaching map. So you quotient by the map that identifies x with the image uh, of x by phi. So you know, let me draw the picture again. So you sort of start with this. So here, you're supposed to think this is your y. And then you consider a handle. which I'm going to draw like this. So this is my handle. So this is my bk times bn minus k. And then I glue it along a map. So then I have a map that takes here, you know, this b, uh, the boundary of bk times bn minus k. And then I glue it to part of the boundary of y. This is my gluing map. So I identify that. And then after I glue, I get a new manifold, which is my manifold y tilde, which is going to go like this. This is my y tilde. And then I have one more step, which is to smoothen the corners. Then we smoothen the corners of y tilde. Okay, so if you are a little, you know, worried about smoothening the corners, uh, you don't know exactly what that means, you can just actually go back to the original description of the handle without uh, this, um, this collapse, collapsing map. And actually, that's, that's one way to define what smoothing the corners is. You can think, oh, this is just a description up to these corners. And if you really want to understand what happens at the corners, how to smoothen these corners, you can actually go back and do the original description. So what's, what was the original construction? The original construction, it's a little bit more complicated, but then you don't need to worry about uh, smoothing the corner. So the original construction is, so given this, 
given this uh, embedding, so if you have an, you still need, of course, an embedding uh, of s k minus one times b n minus k into the boundary of y, and then now you can define this h and define an r. So the h is going to be, you know, sort of this this handle that without collapsing. So it's a set of points x y in um, r k times rn minus k such that um, minus the norm of y of x squared plus the norm of y squared is between minus epsilon and epsilon and the norm of x times the norm of y is less than or equal to delta maybe i actually want to include the whole boundary Okay, so this is the, the original handle, the thing that goes like this. Okay, and then you have to define the R to be, uh, so R is gonna be the boundary of OI minus uh, the image of this diffeomorphism of this embedding. And I take the closure and I multiplied multiply it by minus epsilon epsilon okay uh and then now you can define y tilde to be y union h union r quotiented by uh this map uh and this map th this uh, th the quotient is kind of the obvious thing that you'd want so this quotient is um so if x is on the boundary of y, then, um, well, if, if, yeah, if you quotient by um, x, well, I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to write it down. I, I, I wrote it down the, on the lecture notes. You can, you can read it there precisely, but you can also figure out how you, you quotient it to, to get exactly what you want. So uh, let, me, let me draw the picture, and I think the picture speaks more than, than the word. So if this is your y, um, and then you have your your H, and then you have your um, your R. And you can glue them. Okay. Um, if you if you want the exact thing, you can you can you can look at my notes. But what I claim is that basically, uh, it's this is the same as doing this construction and smoothing the corners. Okay. Homeomorphically, I think it's that it, this is a homeomorphism. I think it's pretty obvious, and that it's a diffeomorphism outside of this uh, this uh, these corners. I think it's also pretty obvious that there's the question of the corners, and it's an extremely local question, and you can check if you're interested. But anyway, I think that we don't need to worry about these corners very much. You know, just think about smoothening in, in the way that um, makes it easier for you. Um, and now we can we can keep going. So um, before I keep going, are there any any more questions about the handle attachment process? So what I'm, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about examples in low dimensions. So if this is still a little hazy for you, maybe the examples in low dimensions are going to help. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any general questions before that. Yeah. Minister, Wait. About this process of is moving the the corner. Yeah. Uh, um. I can't hear you. You're you're breaking up. I have a general manifold with corners. Can we do this process too? You know, uh, Rafael, I, uh, we couldn't hear you. You break. You broke up. At least I did. Sorry. Um, my question is, in general, how we would be? What what should we do to have this this trees move in the, the the corner in a general manifold with corners? Yeah. So on a general manifold with corners, 
what you do is basically the following. So uh, a corner on a manifold with corners is something that gets mapped, has a chart to a, um, uh, to a point. So to the center of the chart is taken to a point that's on the corner of some R uh, of the first quadrant of Rn. So what you do is basically, yeah, uh, so the, the, the smooth chart will take your uh, point in the manifold to, um, to this. I don't know. Then what you do is you compose this with a homeomorphism to Hn, which will take this point to a point on the boundary of Hn. And then now you compose all the charts uh, that are based out of this point with this homeomorphism. And you say, these are no longer smooth charts. These are smooth charts. So you, you have to I change the, the smooth but... structure. So I mean, in a very simple case, I mean, maybe, maybe very concrete. Uh, if you just have in, in dimension two, say that you have, uh, I don't know, your square. So it, here's your square embedded into, th this is just a subset of R2. This is a manifold with corners with just, you know, the, the restriction of the inclusion map into R2 being the charts. How do you make this into a smooth manifold with, with boundary? So at all the corners, what you do is you say, well, if, 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 uh, if my point is at a corner, what is a chart around it? It's no longer the inclusion map. So you take uh, the inclusion map you know, and you kind of rotate it so that it's the map that comes here. And then now you take the composition of this with say the map Z goes to Z squared. So this map, you know, is, a, is gonna be a homeomorphism between a local, a little neighborhood of zero in the first quadrant and something that goes like this. Okay, and then now you say, this is no longer a smooth chart. Now I, I want to throw away all these charts and I want to replace them by the composition of these charts. So now near the, and you do that for each of the four corners. So basically now this, uh, this guy with these new charts is going to be diffeomorphic to a disk. So that's, that's yeah. what smoothening the corners does. So the idea is to take a, uh, homeomorphic and homeomorphic um, topological manifold that is actually a, a different sort of manifold. Um, yeah, basically. I mean, you don't even have to consider a homeomorphic manifold. You can, as a topological space, you can keep the same space. Oh, you, don't, uh -huh. you don't have to replace the points, you know, by other oh. things. Yeah. Uh -huh. You, what you do is you just throw away some some charts and you consider other charts because if you think about the this home, the, the manifold as a home as a topological manifold it already has all these other charts so if you think if you think about um, topological manifold it doesn't make sense to talk about a corner because as at every time you have a, a piece of the boundary you can always take a homeomorphism to something that has a corner and because the the, the topological manifold you know a chart, uh, an atlas is, you know, you always consider a maximal atlas. You have to consider all these charts. But when you consider the smooth structure, then you actually throw away most of the charts and you only keep the ones that are compatible with a given atlas, with that are smoothly compatible. So the process of smoothening a corner means, you know, we throw away chart, you throw away charts, given, you know, specific charts at these corner points, and in, instead you include some other things that are now are gonna be, you know, a, a genuine boundary uh, chart. And the, the point that's not, that, that, that you really have to understand, but it, it's actually very simple, is that there's always a homeomorphism that takes a corner chart to a boundary chart. I see. And that's, yeah, that's what you do. Okay, you. you're welcome. Um, all right. Okay, let's continue. Are you, is your screen black? Same. Same. Huh, I wonder why. Because my screen came back. Um, let's try sharing again.
Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, that's the process of smooth ending query. So now let's look at some examples. I think that's going to be um, very instructive. Uh, so I mean, a corollary of this construction is that every compact manifold can be reconstructed by uh, a finite number of handle attachments. Okay. So now we can ask kind of the, the opposite question. So wh how, what are, let, let's try to see how we can construct manifolds. What are all the possible handle attachments? Up to, you know, some kind of obvious isotopy. So let's uh, start with the example n equals 1. So for n equals 1, we have uh, k equals 0 and k equals 1. So for k equals 0, uh, what, is a, what is a 0 handle? So a 0 handle will be um, a b0 times a b, uh, well, let me write down here to have more space, k equals 0. Uh, we have a b0 times a b1 attached along. Uh, well, that, that's where it gets interesting. I mean, we, all, we already know. We already looked at the case k equals 0 specifically, and we, we knew that it's a minimum, a local minimum, and um, it attached, attaches to nothing. But it's, it's actually compatible with a rote, because it should be attached along s minus 1 times b1. But, you know, s, s minus 1, by, by definition, this doesn't exist. This is the empty set. Okay. So that means that, you know, basically my manifold is um, b0 times u1 is just a b1, so it's an interval attached along nothing. So we think about it as just kind of a little interval is appearing out of nowhere. So when you cross that, that uh, critical value, you just start, you know, you just get a, a little piece of interval. And on the other hand, or well, for the other case, k equals 1, I have a b1 times b0 attached along s0 times b0, which is, you know, you can think of it as like this. OK. Um, all right, so just with this example, if you want, we can, all right, we can prove the classification of one manifold. Okay, so maybe let's take a break and prove that. So classification of one manifolds. So now, you know, if you just know this, now we can prove that any uh, compact and connected one manifold is diffeomorphic to S1 or the interval is 0, 1. OK? Um, how do you prove that? Well, um, now if you understand 0 handles and 1 handles, you're almost done because, um, well, we, we can just pick a, a, a uh, function, a uh, Morse function, with the conditions that we had before. So we know that this uh, manifold x is going to be given by attaching by a finite number of handle attachments. So basically I can write you know E01 up to E0k. These are the the zero handles. And E11 through E1L are the one handles. Okay. Uh, and let's say that they correspond to just to make things you know more precise, they correspond to critical points, to critical points P01, P0K, and P11, P1L, and they're ordered by, uh, by, by, the, by their values. So such that F of P01, uh, so these are increasing, P zero K and F of P one one 
is less than f of p1l and i can't already i can't assume for now that all the that that the f of p0k is less than f of p11 that i don't know yet or i, I can't quite assume that well all i can assume is that the first the, the the first handle to appear is a zero handle and the last handle is a one handle oh. actually that i can't even know like because i'm, I'm my manifold has has boundary um but in general, you know, I, I only know that the first one to appear is a zero handle, and that's it. Okay. So I'm gonna draw just draw the picture, and again, and I have it written down a little nicer on my notes. But sort of the idea is I have a bunch of zero handles until I have my first one handle. So I can I have all the all my zero handles until I get to the to the pre to the value of uh, p11, and that's when I have my first one handle. So I I have the sort of the disjoint union of a bunch of intervals like that. And then I get to my handle E11. How do I attach it? Well, I know it basically, it looks like this. So it means that it has to be attached. E11 is attached along an S0 that's uh, embedded as zero times D0 if you want, but it's just an S0 that's embedded into a disjoint union of zero handles. So then I have two options. So the S, S0 is two points. Either these two points go to the same zero handle. So either uh, I have a situation where they attach like this. So the embedding uh, will, will be like this and it's gonna attach like that. Uh, or we have a situation where um, they are gonna attach to different zero handles. So I have to look at both of these cases. So I'm just gonna, finished by picture. Uh, so either we get this, and that gives you get gives me a circle, an S1. And because I'm assuming that X is connected, then I can't have anything else. And I'm done, and I'm a circle. Or, so it's either this, or I have this other situation where I connect two zero handles. And if I connect to zero handles, it's pretty easy to see that this is just diffeomorphic to an interval, which is the same as you basically can think of it as just the feomorphic to a zero handle. So you can substitute that by just one uh, zero handle, and you can keep going. So by induction, you know this. There are finite. There are finitely many uh, one handles, and so by by induction, you have to finish this process. Uh, and because of connectedness, you have to finish with just one thing. So either you finish with a zero handle, which is an interval, or you finish with a circle. Okay, so that's that's the proof uh, of the classification of, of compact one manifolds. So the rest is just writing all this down, but you know the, this is the this is the key idea. Okay, so actually to classify one manifolds, you don't need to do almost anything. You don't need to do anything else to classify surfaces. It's a little bit harder just with handles. So now let's go. Uh, well, before I, I go to dimension two, are there any questions about this? Dimension one. Eu tenho uma pergunta. Sim. Poderia acontecer uma coisa, tipo, muito louca, assim, de você começar a ter intervalos e daí, de um ponto, você teria, tipo, uma cobrinha subindo e daí o último lá em cima ter um, um teste com o primeiro de baixo? Sim, não tem problema nenhum. Não tem problema Essa nenhum. É... Você Seria. diz, assim, ó, ter uma sequência assim, aí depois... Você precisa de pelo menos dois, né? para não fechar. Então, sim. Aí você, sei lá, você tem mais um aqui, não importa se a altura. E aí você tem um cara assim. É tipo coisas assim poderia acontecer também. Não tem problema nenhum. Não tem problema nenhum. Okay. Yeah. Então, mais ou menos como você sabe se é um intervalo ou você sabe se é um uma esfera, se, se sobra algum, algum ponto no bordo ou se não sobra algum ponto no bordo. Exatamente. É. Se tem bordo, ah. se não tem bordo, é. Ah, entendi. Uhum. Obrigado. De nada. Yeah, the, the attaching map, you know, can be any embedding that's valid, you know, from uh, the um, from the the sphere in this case S zero to the boundary of of what uh, of the the handle body that you have. 
Okay, and in this case, because it's dimension one, you don't even have to smooth in the corners. The you can glue already, you know, on the nose to be a you know to to be to have a smooth structure. Okay, that's basically you know because you can't have a corner on a man, one manifold. One there 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 doesn't exist one manifold with corners. Uh, it's the same as a man, one manifold with boundary. Okay, but let's go to dimension two now. So now. Uh, n equals 2. Um, so now we have k equals 0. So for k equals 0, um, we have a b0 times a b2 attached along the empty set. So you know, k equals 0 is always the same thing. We have a little ball of that dimension that's uh, not attached to anything. So I'm going to draw it like. Um, something like this. Okay, so it's a little disk that just appears. Okay, so now k equals 1 um, is going to be a b1 times a b1 attached along an s0 times b1. So s0 times b1 is just two intervals. So I take a interval times interval, and I attach it on uh, two opposite intervals. So I can think of it as just having a band like this. So we attach it. The attaching area is here. And that's why I, I draw it like this. So you know, the lowest point, the, the minimum of the function on this handle is the attachment, is the, is the, uh, the place where it's attached. OK. And then finally, for k equals 2, we have a b2 times b0 attached along an s1 times b0. So b0, you know, every time we write b0, you can just kind of ignore it, because b0 is just a point, and multiplying by a point is like doing nothing. Um, so here, we can think of it as being you know, a disk, but where you attach along this whole circle. Okay. And with these uh, three objects, you can reconstruct any surface. Okay. And they don't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be orientable with these things, any, any compact surface. And maybe I should just make a quick comment here that actually is true for all dimensions, which is if you, what if you take non-compact manifolds? So for non-compact manifolds, the situation is a lot more complicated because um, you won't have you, you can still think about a handle attach uh, handle decomposition uh, but the function won't have a minimum or a maximum in general so you you have like a an infinite number of handles uh, so it's a lot harder to understand like for example a surface if it's non-compact then it can have infinite genus but that's not enough to even classify the surface. You could have, you know, like the the the, the, the infinite the ways that it's infinite can go to different directions, and I mean it's it's a much more much wilder world, the, like the world of non-compact manifolds. So I'm not gonna talk about that. For one manifold, it's actually not not so hard, but for for um, higher dimensional manifolds, it's significantly harder. Okay, so with these building blocks, we can start uh, building all surfaces. Okay, so um, actually, we can actually classify the surfaces with one small assumption, which uh, you know we can prove that you can do later, which is that you can always choose a Morse function that has only one minimum and only one maximum. So let's let's uh, have an assumption, and I can explain why. We can get to this assumption later, uh, maybe later today, that there always exists. Suppose, suppose X uh, is a compact manifold, a connected compact manifold, manifold. Then there exists a Morse function. with a unique minimum uh, and a unique maximum 
if x is closed. So if you have a closed manifold, which means it doesn't have boundary, then you can assume there is a unique minimum and there is a unique maximum. So there is a unique uh, zero handle and there's a unique n handle. Uh, if the manifold has boundary, then you can assume, then you actually have a Morse function that does not have an n, uh, n handle. So uh, if the boundary of x is different from zero, then um, we may assume that um, x, that f, does, doesn't have index n critical points. So it's even easier in a sense. So what does that mean? That means if you want to build any manifold of any dimension, you start with one zero handle, and then you put all the handles between 1 and n minus 1, and you have exactly one n handle, and that's it. Okay. So if the manifold has boundary, then you don't even need the n handle. But if the manifold doesn't have boundary, then you need to cap it off with a ball at the end. So any connected compact manifold can be constructed like this. So you start with um, your zero handle, which is an n-dimensional ball. Uh, and then you do everything, you know, you, do, you can do a bunch of, you have to do a bunch of handle attachments from one until n minus one handles. And then you close it up with an n handle. OK, so that's how it works. Um, and if, again, if your manifold ha does have boundary, then you don't, you don't even need the n handle. You can reconstruct the manifold up to n minus 1 handle. Okay. I'm going to explain this assumption later, either today or, or uh, tomorrow, why you can always assume that. But let's suppose this for now. And let's, let's classify all surfaces. So here's the classification of surfaces. In other words, let's um, actually let let me not do this. I, I'm gonna. I think I need to talk about something else before. Um, yeah, yeah. I need to talk about some more operations with handles. So I, I, let's let's not do that. Sorry, I, I won't actually need this assumption for now. I'm gonna give one more example, and then I'm, I'm gonna explain how to play around with handles. So the next example is n equals three. Okay. So for n equals three. Um, we again have k, I can go a little faster. So k equals 0, we have a b0 times b3 attached along the empty set. And for k equals 1, I have a b1 times b2 attached along s0 times b2. I think you're getting the hang of it. Um, for k equals 2, I have b2 times b1 attached along s1 times b1, and for k equals 3, I have b3 times b0 attached along s2 times b0. Okay, so uh, let's draw these things. So this is just a three-dimensional ball. It's a little bit harder to draw the Morse function because now, you know, we would need another dimension to really think of, uh, to think of a height within uh, the three-manifold. So we, I'm going to kind of give up on on really drawing the uh, to draw of drawing it bent. You would you would need a fourth dimension. So here, you know, b1 times b2. Uh, this is something like this, and it's attached along the blue guy. Oh, oh sorry, I, I was using a different color. Let's use this color, and this is attached along nothing. Um, this one is attached along S0 times B2. Um, K equals 2, I'm going to think of it as, it's actually very similar. You know, B1 times B2 is the same as B2 times B1. The, the difference between a one handle and a two handle in dimension 3 is where you attach things. So here you attach it along 
uh, S1 times B1. So you attach it along this part. And K equals three is the same as a zero handle, but it's also a, a three-dimensional ball. But now you actually attach it along the whole sphere. And maybe we can have an example so you can see what's happening in three dimensions. Uh, in two dimensions, um, I think I, I already said a little bit last time, but in three dimensions, um, let's let's see uh, what happens. So, so let's say let's see if we can find we can describe a manifold by attaching one handle of each kind. So let's start, you know, with a zero handle. Uh, so that's just a, a three dimensional ball. I start with a three-dimensional ball. And then I want to attach a one handle to it in three dimensions. So I take um, this guy, and let's say what I need to do is I need to choose an embedding of uh, this. So this is an embedding of uh, S0 times B2. So it's an embedding of S0 times B2. And I'm going to attach my one handle like this. So do you see what's happening? What happens after this, this first handle attachment? Can you tell me what manifold they obtain? Parece um toro sólido. Exatamente, yeah. And here you really see that you need to smooth in the corners, right? Because we, you know, we had this sphere, the surface of a sphere, and then I glue to it like a, a little piece of a cylinder, and this thing is not smooth. But after I smoothen it, I have exactly, as Luciano said, a solid torus. So it's the, the torus and the inside of the torus. Now I'm going to attach a two handle, which the one I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put this a cap in the middle of the torus. So I'm going to um, put a thing like this, and I'm going to just insert it like a, I don't know, right here in the middle of the torus. So when I do that, and I do this gluing, what do I end up with? Do you see? A ball. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Go back to a solid ball, right? And then, you know, uh, so I, this is plus a one handle. This is and then I put a two handle, so plus a two handle. And then finally, I actually want a three handle. And what three handle can I use? Well, I can think of this ball as embedded in R3, and I can think of a three handle as the complement of this ball, or I can think of this ball as embedded in R3, which is in S3. So I can think of the complement of this ball. So this complement of this ball, if you think about the stereographic projection about the other point of S3, that's also a ball. So I can, my three handle is going to be, if you want, it's going to be the complement. It's going to be R3 minus this ball union with the point at infinity. That's a three ball too. So this thing here is also a three ball. So I can glue it to this original three ball that I have along this sphere. And what I end up with is S3. Okay, so what I, what I was saying, you know, I can draw a two-dimensional picture, but it's kind of the same thing, is you can think of your S3 as, using the stereographic projection, S3 is the same as R3 union the point at infinity. And um, this ball here gets mapped to this ball. And the point is, if you take the complement of the ball, that gets mapped to this, plus the point at infinity, that's another ball. That's true in any dimension. OK, so this is just a nice little handle decomposition of S3 into four handles, one of each kind. OK, so that's uh, the picture uh, of handles. Um, but are there any questions about this?
what I just said, you know, generalizes to all dimensions. So if actually you can always write an SN as the union of two handles. This is a zeroth handle union and nth handle. So you can always uh, do that. Uh, one way to see that, you know, there is a standard Morse function um, on SN that goes to R that takes, say, X1 to Xn plus 1. So you think of Sn as contained in Rn plus 1. It just takes this to Xn plus 1. And this function has a minimum and a maximum. And it's kind of, it's pretty easy to see that uh, this is just, I mean, it's exactly this picture here. The zero handle will correspond to, say, the southern hemisphere, and the the n handle will correspond to the northern hemisphere. Okay. I mean, technically, you know, the zero handle is just the neighborhood of the max of the minimum, and then you take a diffeomorphism, which is what happens as you just lift up the function, and then at the very end, you put a little cap. This is a this is your zero handle, and this is your and handle. This is like the theory of CW complex. Um, this is this is related, but it's not quite. So, so this is a little different because handles are not the same as cells. So a handle is a, if you if you want a handle is like a thickened cell. Uh, a cell, you know, a K cell is is really like a, a K disc or a K ball. And a handle, a K handle is not a K ball. It's a thickened K ball. It's a K ball times an N minus K ball. Oh, OK. OK. Uh, but one of the things here is you can actually, um, a Morse, so what I explained to you is how a Morse function gives rise to a handle decomposition. But you can actually uh, retract this handle decomposition onto a CW decomposition. So a cellular decomposition. Okay, you're right. Actually, if you're interested in this, I can state a theorem that maybe I won't prove. So it's the following theorem. Uh, so let me first make a definition. So you, if you, you fix f a Morse function, and suppose your manifold is actually closed, just to make it a little simpler. You can do something similar for compact manifolds with boundary. But uh, let's say you, you also fix a um, generic, well, actually doesn't need to be generic, just a gradient like vector field. So you can look at, you know, gradient like vector field is a, great, is a vector field that goes up along the, uh, where, where F increases and then zero at where F, F is zero. And then for each critical point, we can find what's called the unstable manifold. So it's the things that kind of drop out of P. So this is the set of uh, points in X such that, uh, so the, this gradient like vector field has a flow and I'm gonna call it phi T. So this is the flow of V. So the, the unstable manifold is the set of points such that the limit of phi t of x is p as t goes to infinity. So it's, so let me draw. If this is my point p, the unstable manifold will be um, this red thing. Okay, if I, I draw a point if this is my point Q, my unstable manifold is going to be this, uh, including P. Okay, so you can prove uh, it can be shown that this uh, unstable manifold is diffeomorphic to an open ball of dimension k.
And clearly, every point in the manifold belongs to a unique such manifold. So also, every x in, uh, in x belongs to a unique w of p. So either it's a critical point, so it's going to become, a, it's, it's going to belong to w of, of itself, or you have to look at the limit of the flow as t, t goes to plus infinity has to converge to a critical point. So you can write your manifold x as a disjoint union of these wp's for all the critical points. For example, in this case of the torus, you have the, the unstable manifold of p, the unstable manifold of q, then you have the unstable manifold of this r, which is just the point r itself. And then you have the complement. And the complement will be the unstable manifold of this t. And if you, if you just take a torus and you cut it along the red and along the blue, you actually end up with a square like this, but in which, you know, the interior of, of that is diffeomorphic to a, uh, a disk, a two-dimensional disk, two-dimensional ball. Okay? Uh, and then what you can do, so th these guys, you know, they, they, they look like the interior of cells. So this is just if you know about salary decomposition. I don't want to talk about this uh, in this course, but uh, we'll see that in if you if you take the next course, the topology of varieties, algebraic topology that I'm teaching next semester, uh, I'll talk about salary complexes. But anyway, because uh, Joaquin asked about it, uh, these guys are basically the interior. This is the interior of a K cell. Uh, and you have to be a little bit smart about how to, to attach things in the order. But if, you're, if you don't worry about that now, you can see that basically uh, the way, you know, for each critical point, as you go through a critical level, what you're doing is you're attaching a K cell to what uh, you had before. Um, and, you know, this is not exactly uh, correct the way it's stated because, you know, here you're attaching a one cell to a one cell and that's usually not allowed in, in CW complexes, but that's fine. You can, you can perturb things so that you're not doing these things. Uh, but anyway, the, the answer is yes, there is uh, something that, that handles smell very much like cells, but they're kind of a little different. But you can get cellular decompositions from Morse functions as well. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so now I want to talk about some procedures, some modifications of handle decompositions that you can do to, in order to simplify them. And that will allow us to classify two manifold uh, surfaces and to understand three manifolds and four manifolds, at least a little bit. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is what's called handle slides. So what's a handle slide? Well, first of all, to really think of a handle decomposition, remember what we had. We had a, so we, we had this attaching map, which was, uh, so say that you have, so you, you, which was a map from um, S K minus one times B N minus K into the boundary of Y. So Y was a compact, manifold with boundary. The first thing to notice is actually, uh, this, is, this map is a little superfluous. Uh, what you really need is just a map, uh, an embedding from SK minus one into the boundary of Y with a framing. Or I mean, basically this is the same as this up to isotopy. So what's a framing? You know, a framing is just a choice of, of uh, trivialization along the, of the normal bundle, which doesn't always exist. But if it does exist, then we can use this to uh, basically thicken the, this embedding to an embedding of SK minus one times the complementary ball. So for example, you know, if I'm in dimension, um, dimension three, the, the boundary is a two dimensional thing. Uh, if I wanna attach a one handle, what I need is I need to look at an embedding of two points, so an embedding of a, of a uh, S0 that I can then thicken. 
I can then thicken, and then this is going to be my attaching map. And the same thing holds in general, you know, like say, uh, well, let's go one dimension down for another example. So if I'm constructing, if I'm looking at surfaces, uh, you know, the boundary of my surface uh, is going to be a bunch, you know, a uh, one manifold. So if I want to attach a one handle, I need to pick an S0 and I need to thicken it. So thickening it is, is equivalent to uh, having a frame. Uh, so in this case, you know, you can, and as we'll see a little bit later when we're classifying, we can actually choose both of them to go in the same direction, or we can choose one to go in this direction, one to go in this direction, and then we'll have uh, a different handle attachment. Okay, um, so that's, that's what the attaching map is. And a handle slide is something kind of simple. It just means an isotopy of, you know, if, if you uh, isotope this, uh, this embedding or this framed embedding, if you want. So, you know, say that instead of attaching a handle here, you want to move this point a little bit over here. And then now you want to um, move this point over here, and you want to attach a handle here. And the point, there are two ways of thinking this, about this. You can think about this as using handles to construct a manifold, and when you isotope the attaching map, then you, you get a diffeomorphic manifold. That's one way to do it. Another way is you can think about if when you do this isotopy of, of handle attachment, you can actually modify your uh, gradient-like vector field. You can keep the Morse function, but you can modify your gradient-like vector field because the handle attachment really comes with, it's something that derives from a, a Morse function and a gradient-like vector field. So, um, Doing this uh, handle slide, so when you isotope this uh, this embedding, you can actually achieve that by uh, you can achieve the new handle decomposition by just changing your gradient like vector field. Okay, so you know, sort of the idea is so if this is your boundary of y, and I don't know, here is your s. This is your the image of the embedding of s k minus one. So as you move this point, you can actually sort of adjust, and, and your critical point is here. So sort of this is a, this if you want is the unstable manifold of the critical point. So what you want is you actually want to move the unstable manifold within your, within your, uh, your manifold. So as you isotope this guy over here, you will have a new unstable manifold. And you can actually just do that by, by changing your gradient-like vector field. And you can write a calculation. It's in Matsumoto's book, if you want. Um, and I don't want to write this down, but the point is that uh, if, you, if we isotope phi, we get another handle decomposition. Uh, or another handle attachment. For the same um, Morse function. The first thing you can do um, is you can uh, do handle slides. So in dimension one, they, these were not very relevant because you can't really move uh, the image because the, the boundary of a one manifold is just a, it's a discrete set. It's a set of points. So you can't do any meaningful isotopy. That's why I didn't discuss that. But the handle slides will start to become uh, important in dimension two when we try to do um, handle decompositions of surfaces. So let's look at an example, you know, for, for surfaces. So let's start, um, well, we'll start with a zero handle. Um, and, you know, we, it, we say that we want to attach a one handle. So if I want to attach a one handle, I have to choose two points. I have to thicken them, so I have to choose a, a framing. And it's not just a thickening, but it's a thickening with a direction, because it's, it's a product of an S0 with uh, B1. 
so sort of I have to choose whether um, I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm looking at these two B ones like this, or if I'm looking at one, I have basically four possibilities, but two of them are are diffeomorphic. So I can go like this, like this, or I can go like this, like this, or like this and like this. So I can you know basically get rid of these two, uh, and up to a diffeomorphism, I only have two choices. And you can see here that uh, what you obtain with one, uh, what you obtain with with one of them, if you uh, if you uh, orient them the same way, is you put a handle like this, so you get um, a cylinder like this. And if you put a handle the other way. So if you glue a handle um, like this, what mean what that means is like you know this is your interval and this is the interval. So this guy comes here, and this guy comes here. So what you get here is you get a Möbius band. This is a Möbius band. And the first comment that comes from handle attachment is that actually you can move this attaching point, this attaching sphere, can isotope it so that, you know, it doesn't intersect itself, so that's an isotopy, and you're going to get the same manifold. Or in a, another, another way, you can, from the same manifold, you can have the same Morse function so that, you know, now you just have to change the gradient-like vector field to obtain this uh, handle decomposition. Okay, so that's the first observation. Um, but now you can do some things that are more interesting if you add another handle. So if you, if now I add another handle, and let me, okay, let me draw it like this. Okay, now I'm, I'm gonna draw it flat because I think it's a little easier. So say I add one handle, which is like this. That's the one handle. And then I add another one handle like this. So what I can do is I can actually take this attaching map here. So, because I, I do one handle at a time. So first I do this and then I do this. And I can look at this attaching, uh, these two, this S0 here, which by the way, it's called the attaching sphere. And I can find an isotopy, uh, but I can isotope it along the boundary of what I already had. So I can actually take this guy and move it along the boundary of this handle. So I could do this if I wanted. I could take this guy and move it along here and end up with this guy here. So you know this means I take this handle here. If I you know if I could point to it better, I could I, I would do it. But I can just take this part of the handle and I can move it around this upper guy and put it on the other side. So I can end up with um, this picture. I mean, there is nothing that prevents me from having a handle attached like this. And then, you know, I can keep going. And eventually, if I want, uh, just keeping, keeping this side fixed, I can end up with um, something like this. Here's my handle. Okay, this is what I have. What happens after I take? I go from uh, here all the way around here. Okay, I, I hope you can understand my my picture. And I mean, I, I I did this handle slide here, but actually, you can see this is basically the same as this. I didn't change topologically. I didn't change very much. So you know, that's just an operation. But what's actually cool to see is. If I just know about the handle attachments and that assumption that I put at the beginning, now I can actually classify all surfaces. Uh, so if you start to introduce non-orientable surfaces, non-orientable handles, then these handle slides are actually going to do meaningful things. So for example, let's say that I start you know, with my disk, and then I put a, 
non-orientable handle, which means you know I, I put a handle that will take this guy to this guy. Sorry, the third drawing is the same as the first? Huh? The third drawing. It's supposed to be a little different. I mean, it's isotopic to the first, but this is what happens when you take this and you continue moving it over here. So, I mean, if you want, this is, oh. um, you see, like, uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking this and I'm going all the way around. OK. But this is not embedded anywhere. You know, these are just, um, these are just interval times interval attached along this. OK, OK. OK. So actually, I can, instead of drawing all these handles, I can actually just, you know, I'm going to substitute that by just doing this. So here's an arrow. I'm going to just draw arrows on the disk, on the circle. Here's one arrow. And here is another arrow. So this, is, this just means you know, that I'm attaching a handle like this, and this is going to give me the Möbius band. Okay. So now I can attach another handle, and let me use other another color. So let's say I'm going to use red. So I'm going to attach a handle like this. How do I want to attach it? I don't know. Let's say I want to attach it. Um, for, well, actually, before I do this, let me let me go back. And we let's look at the, the two possibilities that we have for attaching a handle. So what I as I told you, if you start with just one zero handle, you have two ways of attaching uh, a one handle. So you can either have something that looks like this. So sort of the two arrows are facing each other. And that means, you know, this means you go like this. So this is the orientable thing. After you attach this handle, the surface is still orientable. So this is the first possibility. Or you can do, um, you can attach them like this. So the two arrows kind of are going in the same direction. And that gives you the Möbius band. So this gives you the cylinder. And this gives you the Möbius band. OK, so now uh, if we're trying to classify surfaces, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to we start with a zero handle, and then we attach as many one handles as we can. And at the end, we close with a two handle. OK, so let's do this. Uh, let's try to do this systematically. So if I start with a cylinder, now I can attach another one handle. Um, so I can do, you know, I can basically do what? Um, now I can attach um, a one handle like this. Let's just do this orientable thing. Or I can take this guy and put it over here. Okay, so these are the two things I can do. So if I, then the point is that they are different. Uh, and if I um, um, take this guy uh, over here and I move and I do a handle slide, what happens, you know, one, one way to see the handle slide is I can think of this as kind of being the back and this is the front of my arrow. When I do the handle slide, I can move, I move this guy over here and then I move it along the handle and then I come out over here. So after the handle slide, this uh, guy will go, and it's just basically going to become the same. Like so, the the back goes in here, and then the back comes out first. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be like this. Okay. Um, so anyway, like topologically speaking, I don't, I haven't changed anything with this handle slide. And the other thing you can, you have to see is actually either in this case or in this case, I cannot finish my more, uh, my handle, my handle decomposition with a two handle because the boundary has too many components. So when I look at just the cylinder, the boundary has two components. Uh, 
So here's one component of the boundary plus the handle, and then here's another component of the boundary plus the handle. Okay, so when I look here, actually now the boundary is gonna have even more components. The boundary is gonna have four components here. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that when I, when I, if I keep attaching handles like this, then, I'm get, then my boundary is getting more and more connected components. Eventually, I have to get to one connected component only so that I can put a disk and close it up. Okay, so how do we get that? So, so this process, you know, is kind of a little convoluted of classifying all manifolds, but I think uh, I'm, I'm doing it, you know, kind of on the spot, and I kind of want you to be able to reconstruct it later. So let's go back to the cylinder and see what you can actually do to get one connected component. So if you start with a cylinder... Vinícius. Oui. A primeira parte de andar sobre os, as alças... Sim. É porque não tem... É para tirar os entrelaçados entre as alças. Então você não precisa entrelaçar. É isso? Não, você sempre pode... Você sempre pode fazer um handle slide e mover esse ponto para fora da, da, da um alça. So, I think what you're saying... Oh, não. Entrelaçado você diz... É... Elas não são adjacentes. Você sempre pode considerá-las de adjacentes. Não necessariamente. Esse é o ponto, né? O ponto é que, se você tiver um cilindro, né? Que você começar com duas... É, deixa, deixa eu fazer de, outra, de cores diferentes. Se eu fizer... Digamos que eu, que eu coloco... Eu coloco primeiro essa alça azul. Certo. Depois eu coloco essa alça vermelha. Né? Se eu fizer um handle slide, se eu tentar fazer um handle slide para tirar esse vermelho daqui, né, ele vai entrar por aqui, por esse ponto daqui. Isso aí é ele mesmo. vai sair por esse ponto daqui e vai, vai, vai vir para cá. Então você vê que eu não consigo fazer o vermelho vir para o lado de cá. Né? Eu tenho que é, Esses dois, eles, eles estão entrelaçados, não tem como. Se você fizer o desenho em três dimensões, você pode até se convencer. Né? Melhor, se você coloca essa alça aqui e você coloca essa outra alça. Aqui, né? É, você tem que fazer o desenho muito bem para você não fazer o negócio errado. Né? Desculpa, deixa eu tentar fazer de novo. Ok. You can, você pode se convencer, you can convince yourself that, that if you move this guy over here, it's gonna end up on the same side. Entendi. Ok. But, but this is actually good. Isso, isso é importante. This is actually good because. That means that when you do it like this, then you have one, only one connected component, the boundary. Look, the boundary now is going to be uh, this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and this, and this, and this, and this. So the boundary has one connected component, which is what you need to be able to say, now I can put a two handle, and I can close it up. So then, that means you can put a two handle and you can close it up. And, you know, it's kind of, now you can see that what happens, you know, up to diffeomorphism is what you, no, so, so when you add the two one handles, what you get is you get this. And then the two handle is the little capping disc that you need to get an actual torus. So you got a torus. Okay. So this is kind of the first, uh, most basic thing you can do. Um, and yeah, so you can, of course, you know, keep doing this procedure and adding a, a blue and a, and a red handle several times. And then you get uh, basically uh, G holes. So you get a, a certain number of holes. So you can uh, do this procedure, do this procedure a number of times. Uh, and then you get uh, a surface with n holes. And then at the end, you just have one circle left and you cap it off. Uh, Vinicius, Oi. esse desenho que você faz, esse desenho que você faz colocando toros é sempre o desenho colocando só altas orientadas. Sim, é. exatamente. É porque meio que não tem como fazer o desenho colocando ossos não orientadas. É, dá para fazer um desenho meio... Não dá para ser mergulhado, né? Mas dá para fazer um desenho sim. 
é, mas não é um desenho tão bonito, não é uma representação de repente. Eu não cheguei, eu não cheguei ainda nas alças é, não, não orientadas, né? ainda não. Mas eu quero come, eu começando aqui com as alças orientadas. Né? Okay, so starting with the, with the orientable handles, this is um, this is all you can do. And in fact, you can notice that if you don't have them intertwined, then all you're doing when you start putting orientable oriented handles is you're increasing the number of connected components of the boundary. So, you know, if I started, for example, with my blue one, um, like this, and then I put a red one, and I don't intertwine it, then I actually, I'm, I'm going to have more connected, the boundary is going to have more connected components. So in order to decrease the connected components and have it back to one, you have to start adding handles that are intertwined. Okay, so you know it's maybe a little combinatorial exercise to to, sh to see that even if you start, you know, first you add a bunch of non-intertwined -inter handles, then as you start intertwining them, then um, you actually go back to the original example, the simplest thing of just you know adding a pair like. Uh, two handles like this, and then you add two handles like that, and you add two handles like that. So you can do this with handle slides, for example. So if I start with this, and then I, then I add a handle, I don't know, here, uh, here, and then I add, say, I don't know, an orange handle here and here. So there, um, Yeah, so, yeah, I, I don't know. You, you have to check the combinatorics, but sometimes you, really, you, you have to check. If this has exactly one connected component, the boundary of this, that means they can do some permutation, some handle slide, to actually get to two copies of this, of this original guy. So when, by two copies of that, I mean, you know, you can take your circle and you can do one, you can add the, the two handles here, and then you can add the two handles here. So if you have two separate things going on, which means you know you start with your disk, and then you th th this part here would correspond to something like this, and then this part here would correspond to something like this, and then you kind of just you keep going, uh, and that's the procedure to show that if you just add or not orientable hand handles, then you can you have to get uh, a surface like this. Uh, which you can think of just as a connected sum of tori. Um, okay, that's so this G connected sum of tori. And in the non-orientable case, so if you allow you one handle to be non-orientable, I think this is first observation is if you allow one handle to be non-orientable then basically there's no, there's no sense of orientable and non-orientable anymore. Because now if I can add another handle that say looks orientable like this, but then I can do a handle slide and I can move this guy over here. And when it comes out here, it's gonna come out non-orientable, you know, with respect to the original orientation of the circle. So if I put this guy and I move it over here, then what I end up with is something that will look like this. So what really matters here now, you know, once you have one handle that's non-orientable, then now it's just about the number of, of uh, co connected components of the boundary. So are you, are you left with one connected component only? Then you can close it up and have a closed manifold. If you're left with more than one connected component, then you can't close it up. Okay, and you have to, to, to do a little more. But the thing that's actually interesting is using handle slides, um, you can see that every, at every moment, you can substitute what you already have by just adding one more non-orientable um, 
non-orientable uh, handle in a little neighborhood. So uh, basically, if you have one uh, non-orientable handle, then basically you can assume that all the handles are just attached without being intertwined. And this is an exercise in understanding handle attachments. Um, and maybe, maybe you should do that. You should do this uh, today before tomorrow, which is that if you have one, let me say it again. If you have one handle that's like this, a so non-orientable handle, uh, which is the same as saying, you know, have an embedding of S0 with this framing where they both go in the same direction, then if I put any other, any other handle, then I can always like un, um, untwist it so that it becomes just a not, another non-orientable handle and another non-orientable handle and so forth. Okay. I mean, the exercise is actually a little bit more complicated. So if you have a bunch of, of one handles that are attached so that the, at least one of them is non-orientable, and if the resulting thing has um, just one connected component, then up to some handle slides, you can assume that all of them are like non-orientable handles that are attached separately without being intertwined. And then this is a little convoluted and a little complicated. But the point is, uh, that it's actually possible to attach a handle that's going to disconnect the boundary. So then that's not, you know, that's not true, but you have to add another handle that connects the boundary, and then it can do some handle slides to have three separate, um, three separate handles. But anyway, we're almost at the end. But the point is that if you just have one uh, disconnected handle, uh, one, uh, not disconnected, one uh, non-orientable handle, then, you know, basically you have your, um, your zero handle, and then you have this Mibius band type thing. Um, then basically, you have another Mibius band type thing, you have another Mibius band type thing, and at every point, uh, you can always close up with a, with a ball, with a disk, and you can close up the manifold. So what you're doing here, basically, is you're taking, if you just start from one Mibius band and you close it up with a disk, then you get an RP2. as, as we, we saw uh, a few classes ago. But so if instead of doing this, you actually put another non-orientable handle and you close with a, uh, with a disk, then what you're doing is you're doing a, a connected sum with another RP2. So you're just removing two disks and you're gluing them. So, but if you don't do this and you keep going, what you're doing is you're doing connected sums with more RP2s. So, what this is claiming is that uh, the other uh, way of getting surfaces, you know, is by doing these handles, is just taking connected sums of RP2s. So basically, uh, the surfaces are either connected sums of tori or connected sums of RP2s. And one thing that you need to realize is that if you take one RP2 and you take a connected sum with a torus, that's the same thing as taking an RP2 and taking the connected sum of two RP2s. And you can prove this with handle slides, for example. This is kind of this is what I was kind of trying to say. Like, if you start with a with a non-orientable handle, and then you add to it uh, intertwining pair of orient of oriented handles, say you add something like this, then maybe this is kind of the crux of the exercise. Then you can do some handle slides to transform this into three non-orientable handles that don't uh, intertwine. Okay, so maybe this is like the main exercise that I'd like you to do for tomorrow. And this is going to prove exactly this: that if you do an RP2 first, so you do one non-orientable handle, and then you do these two intertwined handles that will give you the torus. That's the same as doing three. Um, this is the same as doing. Is three non-orientable handles that don't intertwine.
Okay. All right. So uh, I think that's enough. Uh, we I know this today was very kind of not very precise. Tomorrow I'll try to explain uh, some of these things in a more uh, precise way, and I'll, and then I'll talk about changing the value of the function uh, and reordering the, the critical points, and also this beautiful thing called uh, cancellation of critical points, which is what allows you to assume, for example, that there's only one uh, index zero critical point. OK, let's uh, end here.